talking about is Isabella Gianni. She's she's the the star of our retrospective. How did you get to cast her? Um, it, it was it, it was the well we couldn't find we f could not find a girl in England that we really liked to play a part. And then um, Amber Belzar and. Uh, I think it was his idea that we should try possibly with her, and um, um, I called her up from Saxon Avenue <laughs> in a phone booth, and um, they'd given her the script, and she liked it, and she said uh, she thought she'd want to do it. I mean, I, don't I mean, it, it was such a wonderful thing to have happen, really. I mean. She was uh, such a wonderful actress and, and uh, so beautiful and just right in every way. Yeah. And she, her English is certainly up to the up to the part. She was up to the part. We had to slightly change the story. We made her, we made her uh, coming from uh, I don't know Martinique or somewhere like that. Yes, Actually, right. Jean Reese, uh, uh, the, the hero of that of that novel, did not come from uh, from a French island. In she was from the, the uh, Dominican, yeah, the, exactly, her mother. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. But that was Very part. Rich. What was was that part of the book though? Where oh no, the the main the main character was from England, right? But she wasn't. Queen no, no, no. She, uh, I think, uh, I believe she was also from the. You know, I don't remember anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and do you remember how it was to work with Isabella Jenny? Because in person, so she was here earlier this month. And she's quite an intense uh, person, and uh, it feels like she gives herself 120% in films. How, she, how she, was she it? Does. Yeah. She did, always, always. <coughs> um, and we didn't have much rehearsing, rehearsals. Uh, she didn't uh, feel that she needed that. I, I mean, uh, there was re the rehearsals on the set, the, the day that we were shooting, or the scene that we were shooting. She, she would re rehearse with everybody else, obviously, but. Uh, she just really kind of jumped in. <laughs> and then you have a, you brought a wonderful cast of actors, Alan Bates and Maggie Smith. They're all mm. quite wonderful too. And did is are these people that you thought about early on for the film, or Alan? And both of them were very well known. At the I, I think time. Alan Bates. Uh, we we thought about him quite early, probably at the very beginning, and. Um, uh, the others just came. I mean, the French French actors I would not really have known about. Yeah, Suzanne Flon, uh, particularly mm -hmm. Suzanne Flon and um, Daniel Mesguiche, for instance, who we used mm -hmm. again and again and again in our films. Uh, the fellow at the end who goes, who says there's nothing beautiful anymore. Yeah. And um, so they were all new to me. Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. And this was your first film shot in Paris, and most of your work before that was made in India, is that right? And then your first film well, was Well, we made this film in, in 1980, and then the work that we had before that, the work that we had done, um, was not in England, as people would think. Right. The English films were quite a few years off. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. No, our films have been made either here in New York, or in, in this country, or in India. In India, yeah. Right. But you, did you know Paris well, though? Because it feels like the, it's... You, well, it's, you I, fit I, right in, in I the, had been to Paris many times, and uh, I knew it, yes. I mean, as well as you can, you know, as a foreigner. I, ne I never had lived there, and, and I, in the sense that, well, when we were making the film, I lived there, and then later on, I re re really did live there uh, in the 90s. In the, yeah, in right? the 90s. Yeah. After that, in fact. Yeah. And how did you meet Pierre Because so most of the crew, as I understand, is French. And so how did you meet Pierre Because Pierre was already, uh, had worked quite on a lot of films. At that well, again, he was, he was uh, it was the, the French producers uh, suggested that. Oh, yeah. and, and I remember we went to, uh, we went up to meet him. We drove up, uh, Ambert Balzan drove, uh, like 100 and 25 miles an hour to Normandy, where he was, Pierre Lund was making a film with Jane Birkin. And uh, I went to meet him there, somewhere in Normandy, I don't know where it was. And uh, there was Jane Birkin also, I'd never met before. Yeah. So. 
And you went on to make several films together. Yeah. Yeah, four, I think. Four, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, there was uh, this this film, and then uh, we made Morris uh, with him. We made Little Divorce. We made Jefferson in Paris. And then we made another Merchant Harvey film in India with him, and it is well directed, called Cotton Mary. Oh, yes, that's right, yeah. It was a, a fifth film, yeah. And I, we'll, we'll open it open it up for questions uh, in a minute, but I was I was curious about the book because I think the it must not have been necessarily an easy book to turn into a script writer, right? <laughs> well, it, um, I, I didn't write the script. I mean, our, our, our longtime uh, writer, Ruth Zambella, wrote it. Actually, she was against the idea of our making it. Oh, really? But she was reading Jean Rees, um, I guess all her novels. So, Anyway, that novel, and she left that novel lying around somewhere, and I think in the house of Clavrack. And I picked it up and read it, and I loved it immediately, even uh, grim as it is, I, I, because I've always been interested in Paris in the 20s. And I thought immediately, oh, I would, I mean, this would be a wonderful film to make. And, and she said, oh, Jim, I don't know, it's so low-spirited. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I, I convinced her, and we we did make it, and uh, had, uh, had very good French partners. Yeah, and it, was, it was sort of a turning point for me, also. I think it was the first. I really feel that this film was the first time that I kind of got I kind of got it all together in the sense of all the different elements that seemed to have a kind of for me anyway. I, I had found some kind of harmony. Uh, Visually and, and the acting, the story, and the music, uh, the locations. Uh, let's let's take a, f a few questions. If you want to raise your hand, there are microphones in the aisle. We can bring one down to you. There's, I think, someone with long black hair. I want to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Does this film seem another kind or a different kind of mercenary movie? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I felt that strongly when I watched it. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. As a, as a Merchant Ivory. It's yeah. not your usual Merchant Ivory movie, no. Um, well, it's, it's pretty grim, also. It is pretty grim. Um, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Ivory, for being here and for the beautiful film. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, of course, Isabella Gianni's uh, English was certainly up to the task of, of being the lead in a primarily English-speaking film. Um, however, for someone whose English is a second language, um, did, you, was, did you have to direct her um, any differently uh, than the other actors? And I was also wondering if you could talk just very briefly about what it was like working with Alan Bates. Well, I didn't uh, know. The fact that uh, uh, English was not her first language, and she knew it very well. I didn't have to tell her, put the emphasis here, or you know, this word. Uh, I, I was not correcting her all the time about how to speak, or how to, uh, how to, uh, you know, the actual emphasis that, that lies with me, that with me she, she had all that. I mean, it was, it was there. And so it wasn't difficult working with her. And I worked many times with, and, and particularly in India, with actors whose English was not their first language. And it's uh, really actors quite soon are able to somehow get it. And uh, you, you don't have to, it's not a, a labor. Uh, for them to get it right, or, or you to agree that it's right. I mean, they pretty much do it well right, right off, and so, and so, so did she. Yeah, she's quite good. Yes. Yeah. And Alan Bates. And that's right, Alan Bates. Uh, uh, well, he, I guess, pretty much, he was the first of our first of our English heroes. If you want to call Heiner a hero, and um, uh, he was a. A, a wonderful uh, person to work with. I mean, extremely easy going and easy to be with, and, and uh, no problems with him. I mean, I, I, 
when people ask me, well, uh, what was it like to have such and such a person? And they're expecting to say, me to say, well, there was this and there was that, and I wish they hadn't done this and so on. I don't, don't have those kinds of feelings about most of my big uh, English actors that I've worked with, or Alan Bates. They are so extraordinarily professional as actors, so totally committed to what they're doing, and so aware of what they're doing, and, and aware of what you want, or agreeing on the whole to what you want. And he was like that always. I mean, his performance is very, his character is very interesting. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, people were laughing when he was commenting that, you know, these women actually come on to him, and, and that, that, that's, uh, which he very much believed too. So it's an interesting performance because it's, uh, you kind of question everybody's intentions, really, I think. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, There, there were things that uh, there are there are always things that, that uh, you know you have to you you have to change a little bit and move them a little bit this way or that. But I believe very very much in uh, allowing actors really to bring up from their from their, the depths of their their being the, the part. I mean they are artists and as and let them. Let them show you their art. I, that's how I believe in working with actors, and uh, you can do that very much with English actors and with French actors. Well, American too. I mean, everybody. I mean, you just let them <laughs> show it to you what it is they feel they, they want the part to be, and uh, unless they go wildly off, I mean, you're lucky. So you have it's it's a faith in act, in actors. Yes. And a yes. Trust. Yeah. Um, right here, there's a question. At the uh, why is it that every film that Johnny appears in, as lovely as, as splendid as she is, can, she can, you, can you just Jeff? Yeah, thank you. Why is it that uh, it's a pleasure to see you? By the way, by the way, um, great privilege. Uh, it seems to me during this festival, Johnny. Every film she appears in that I see, she's demeaned and degraded and reduced and, re and, and made into, into nothingness. And it's upsetting for a woman today. And I don't want to be a feminist, but I can't help it. Um, she's demeaned. And in this film, she again ends up demeaned and, and made into nothing while she's a woman of fortitude and some grace and some talents. Well, that's Jean Reese, uh, and th th this is Jean Reese's uh, sort of all Jean Reese's novels are like that. If you know Jean Reese and you've read the other novels, I mean, she she did uh, get attached to some pretty terrible men, and uh, particularly, the, I mean, the historical background of this film is, is and, and the story is uh, it's pretty well known, and, and she had had a fearful uh, relationship with her. A famous man. So I mean, I'm just. Uh, what can I do? I have to. <laughs> I have to do Jean Reese as she wanted it to be done. Such a pity, though. I mean, I, 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 I think there must be some exceptions to that. There must be some other films of Isabel where she was happy. <laughs> no. There. Um, most of it, she has a, a very good comic strike actually, but she didn't exploit it that much. But I think she actually looked for characters uh, like that as well throughout her career. I mean, she, uh, so she did Camille Claudel later, and that's a project that she wanted to do herself, and she produced it, and wanted to play Camille Claudel, but it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting point. That's the role that she was offered, but I think that's the roles that she was looking for as well. I saw her today in a different way. Uh, I, by now, after all these years, and goodness, we made this 40 years ago, I've seen it many, many times. But I never really watched her carefully when she sings that song, Par. And today I did. And, uh, I, I mean, I paid very close attention to it. She's absolutely marvelous in that. That's a wonderful thing she does there. So. Uh, sir? 
When you first met Ishmael, can you just hold, just hold on yeah. the microphone? Thank you. When you first met Ishmael Merchant, was it love at first sight, or did it take you boys a while to figure out things? <laughs> Um, well, at, at, at first sight, I knew this was a, a, a most uh, uh, interesting young man that, that um, I had just come back from working in India, where I'd met many other Indians, and, and, uh, and I met Ismail here, and, and we got to talking, and, and he was doing other things and working on other kinds of films, but yes, I was immediately... I thought, this is a great person, a great guy. Sure, of course. So it was a coup de foudre, uh, love at first sight? No. <laughs> As I suggested. Not then. really. Not really. But he grew on me. Yeah. What a shame that he's gone. But you he grew on a lot of people. <laughs> so, that was... Is there, there's a question in the, all the way in the back. Uh, <laughs> yes, good evening. I would like to ask you this important question on uh, the sense of cruelty that there is for this woman uh, in the sense that whether it was for richer or for poorer, she was going to have no true happiness. Uh, my question to you is, based on the author, did you emphasize the author's uh, life experience or when you did the direction, you took uh, your own approach in the perception of that uh, novel? Well, let me just say, in, in a way, you, you would almost have to tone it down. I mean, uh, Jean Reese's experiences, uh, her life experiences, which come out in her fiction, and are very, very strong in quartet. You, you don't. Uh, you have to be careful. You have to think about your audience a bit. You couldn't make Heidler. I mean, Heidler was really beastly, and uh, and, and the whole situation was a, a, a horrible thing that. Them living together and, and Lois and all the rest of it, and what happens at the end. And you had to be careful, you had to tone it down a bit. I, we had to tone it down a bit. Otherwise, we would turn off the audience. And in fact, it was not a film, even though it won at Cannes for Best Actress for, for Isabel, and, uh, uh, and certainly um, much was made of it when it came out in France. It was never a popular film, it is just too depressing. And I think today, I mean, I'd be surprised. To, I mean, I, I would think many, many women uh, seeing this film would be outraged by this film. I couldn't help but be. How could things have been like that? Uh, so, but I, we did slightly tone it down. You have, when, when things are really terrible sometimes in, in a novel, you can't really show it. Um, it will turn the, audi uh, the audience off, so, so from your, mainly from your main characters from the, or from the film itself. You just have to tone things down a little bit, and we did here. I mean, for instance, an example of this in, the, in another film of ours was the Surviving Picasso. We read, uh, or we, we learned in, from Francois Gillot's book, Life with Picasso, that at one moment in her life with Picasso, he stubbed his cigarette out on her cheek. Now you couldn't put that in the film. If you'd done that, if we'd done that, uh, it would have turned everybody off horribly against the character of Picasso. It was so monstrous. So you have to tone things down as you go along. Otherwise, you'll, you'll really uh, anger your audience. I think. Well, stay in the back. There's a picture, uh, hand up right in the middle of the theater. The costuming and the presentation of 1920s Paris. And I'm curious to know if you got inspiration from that, mostly from the book or from other research. You mentioned your own interest in 1920s Paris. How did you put that all together? 
Well, I didn't put it together. It's the, <clears throat> we had a, a wonderful costume designers, wonderful hair and makeup people, uh, terrific uh, uh, French art director. Uh, it's they who did this. It was, a, it was their gift to me. This is the actors acting as a gift to me. I didn't know that much about, I mean, I'd always been interested as an American, because Americans in Paris in the 20s and all the rest, and F. Scott Fitzgerald, et cetera, et cetera, Hemingway, all that. That had always interested me, but I didn't really know much about it. And I had no real visualization of it. I mean, you would see photographs and books and whatever. I mean, you, you had, had an idea how it might have looked. But really, it was made by the people who are there at the credits, the designers. I, it wasn't because of me that much. I, I didn't know that much, and this has been true of all my films. I, I don't know how people dressed and looked and acted in, in certain periods. I didn't know much about Edwardian in England. I, I had not very much interest in Edwardian in England, but I know we did a <laughs> pretty good job with it. But that's not because of me. I, I'm, just, I'm just taking it all in and using it. And, Happy to get it. Well, you, you knew how to surround yourself with the best people, then. Well, but, yeah. You, well, you 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 hear about people, and, and if somebody's really good, you use them again and again, like Pierre Lum. I mean, uh, once once you've established a relationship with a very good artist who works for you in a film, you want to use that person again and again, and you try uh, you try to to do that. You very often you can't. Uh, they may go on to uh, all kinds of other jobs and fame and so on, and they're not available anymore. But at Merchant Ivory Prices. Uh, there's a question right here. It was a pleasure to, to watch the movie and obviously to have you here. and. My question is kind of on the question that you were talking about uh, two questions ago, where you had the darkness in the movie. And my question is, even when you're watching a movie that, that had that much darkness in it, seeing the way that you portrayed the costume, seeing the way that you did the cinematography, seeing the, the beauty in the film almost sort of mitigates the darkness to it, was that done as a conscious effort? Or was that you know, just the way that it happened to work out? Well, it wasn't accidental, no. Uh, you, you do try to make things, uh, as, as, in all the different areas of design anyway, you want, you want to make it as wonderful as possible. I mean, you, you intend that. Does that answer your question? Probably not. It's almost like the beauty, the, the beauty made up for the darkness, because you're watching such a beautifully made movie that well, you're also seeing a world that we don't know much about. It's a long time since the 20, I mean, 100 years since the 20s in Paris. And uh, we don't know anything about that. So what, what, what you're seeing there is all new. And it, it, I mean, some of the things that are happening, are happening are pretty desperate. But the world is very, very interesting that, that these things are happening in. So, yeah, well. So we have time for a couple more questions, right, right here in the middle. Hi, I had met with uh, Ismail because he went to school with my dad, and I used to see Ruth all the time in the neighborhood because we all lived in the same lived, lived in the same neighborhood. I was just wondering, do you feel a creative void um, in all of your film projects without the two of them? Sorry, sensitive question. Well, there haven't been any without. I mean, it, the, the only film that I made without, and then Ismail was in fact involved at the beginning of that, and, and so was Ruth, because she wrote the script. The only film that I made without them was uh, City of Final Destination in, in Argentina. And, um, but since then, yes, I very much, uh, I miss them uh, terribly. And Ismail, um, and by dying prematurely, I mean, it was 
there were, were other films being planned that I'm sure we would have made. There was this little, for years we were trying to make a Shakespeare film out of the play Richard II. And if, if Ismail had not died, we would have made that five years ago. And um, so yes, in that way I do miss them, of course. I mean, I miss them as, as people, as my closest associates and friends. And, and, uh, but I, I miss them in that way, but naturally, but also, yeah, in a work way, of course. Hi, my name is Valerie, and I'm here just to tell you that uh, as many people here probably feel the same way, um, I grew up watching your films. I was totally inspired by your films. Sorry, suddenly I'm quite emotional, but I was so inspired that I made the film industry my profession for many years. Worked with Jeff Berg and Rosalie Swedlin at ICM, and then with Michael Ovitz at AMG. Before that, all fell apart. And, um, and it was due to films that you made. I'm sorry? No. It, it was due to films that you made that inspired me to make a career. Well, of course, since then, I've gone into real estate, and I'm very <laughs> But I'm sitting here, and you are my living legend. And so I'm here because I wanted to see you in person. Well, I'm still here, <laughs> amazingly. Are you, are you working on, on, on anything? Yes, I am. Yeah. I am. I recently wrote a screenplay for Alexander Payne, which was based on a short story that came out of the New Yorker a couple of weeks after Ruth died, and which he uh, optioned back in uh, 2013. And I wrote a screenplay for him. Um, and then I think I'm going to be involved in in writing the screenplay of a French novel. And I'm also, uh, I'm involved in writing in a screenplay of another novel by, by Peter Cameron called Coral Glen. So I have these three, three, three projects. But I, I mean, uh, d d directing, uh, no, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I don't know to what extent I, I could get out there and do it. This is temporary, all this, you guys. I have a terrible back right now, but it'll go away. Which, can you tell us which French novel you're working on, or is it? I really shouldn't, because the, the deal has not been, okay. so I've been asked to do it, but uh, we haven't, it's, yeah. but it's, it's, so a, fa we'll it's a famous French novel. <laughs> We'll, we'll be patient. Uh, let's take one more question. The... Yeah. Uh, I'm from India. Uh, I tried to... I think I came to your office some time ago. I think 57th Street. Uh, I'd meet with the smile. He was not there. My question is, now the smile is gone. Uh, are you interested in doing more, some more projects? Involving with India, or that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is uh, you guys started with a low budget, now you became legends. How did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about India first. I, I don't, I haven't been to India uh, since 2006, and I really don't want to do another, but more more work in India. Uh, I just, everybody I knew is gone. Uh, the India I knew is gone, uh, at least the metropolitan parts of it. I, I, I don't feel like doing any more and, and uh, there. And then, well, I don't uh, know how to, I mean, Everybody starts out like we do. You start out making low-budget movies, and, and if you're successful with one or two of them, then you will attract more money, 
and that you're more or less successful with the next phase and, and you don't have too many flops, so you may get big money finally and you, uh, then of course you most often ruin yourself and <laughs> never do another film, but that didn't happen with us. We were, we were uh, f fully f funded by the studios right up to the, uh, right, well almost to the very end, through, through The White Countess, which is uh, the second to the last film we made. So, um, I don't know, you take, you just start out with little money and gradually you get more. <laughs> I mean, what, what can I say? This is true of any business, right? You could be making socks. So, 